education and also finding fossils and good people to talk about fossils. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'm Mike Scherr, Jell's a Jacksonville board member, and it's my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, if everyone can remember to mute their cell phones. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Forrest Gaughan, and Forrest grew up in Burlington, Iowa, which is ground zero for paleozoic And uh, so I, I'm guessing he's been collecting them for quite a while. He very, very kindly brought a whole table full for us to look at. And these are amazing specimens. These are from our backyard. These are all Teton crinoids. Uh, Forrest has been a professor at BYU Rexburg for about 10 years. He got his bachelor's in geology from BYU Provo, master's from the University of Cincinnati, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, his thesis there was on parasitism and predation on Paleozoic crinoids. His postdoc was at the Smithsonian. If I were to list all of his papers, research projects, he wouldn't get a chance to talk tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Forrest Gaughan. Just do a quick microphone check first. Is that all right? Yes. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you this evening. Uh, until just very recently, I wasn't aware of the existence of this organization, and I'm very grateful to know of it. I'm grateful for the invitation just to uh, know of this, of this organization for nothing else. I'm really surprised by the turnout tonight and grateful for it. It's always nice to have uh, a group of listening ears uh, about one of my favorite subjects, which is, which is fossil crime woods. Uh, tonight, I hope to transport you back to a time before uh, the Tetons existed here in the Jackson Hole area um, and talk to you specifically about the marine organisms that lived there. Uh, if we go back uh, to this area about 350 million years ago, again, Jackson Hole looked very different and it was also in a very different place. Uh, if we go back to the Mississippian period specifically, uh, back to the Carboniferous, uh, in North America, the lower part of the Carboniferous is called the Mississippian. And that is how I will refer to it for the rest of the evening. Uh, during that time, the whole Jackson Hole area was covered by a relatively warm, shallow sea, not too far north of the equator. This is a reconstruction of the globe back in the Mississippian period, about 350 million years ago. Uh, this red dot indicates the position of Jackson Hole at that time. And again, in this reconstruction, you can see that Jackson Hole is situated in the midst of a large sea that was actually covering much of North America at the time. And just to the northeast of us was a set of mountains that are often referred to as the Antler Mountains or the Antler Orogeny. This is another map of the northwestern part of the United States. And this uh, pattern indicates the position of those ancient <coughs> antler mountains. Just to the east of those mountains was a large deep water basin, a, a basin of deep marine water. And as you move even further to the east, you get up onto a relatively shallow carbonate platform. And again, an environment that was this, this was an environment that was much more like the Bahamas uh, than the environment that we see in Jackson Hole today. So again, I'm hoping to transport you back into a different time and place. That time is the Mississippian period about 350 million years ago. And that place is just north of the equator when Jackson Hole in this entire area was covered by a warm, shallow sea. That sea way, if you look at it from this perspective, if we go below the surface of the water, um, we see mostly a gradual slope that descended into, into relatively deep ocean water. And because of periodic storms, and because of uh, often failure of the slope, 
higher up on this in this in this ancient marine system. A lot of marine sediment was transported down into the deeper waters, into the deeper part of the slope of this marine environment, and uh, also onto the basin floor. And these sediments are preserved at the tops of some of the peaks in the Teton Range, as well as in the surrounding area. This is an example of those sediments uh, with Glade Gunther uh, from the famous uh, Gunther fossil family down in, down in the Utah area. Glade's a great friend of mine, and uh, we spent a lot of time looking at the geology in this area. But again, these deposits mostly represent marine deposits that were deposited as debris flows, sediment flows that were transported down slope about 350 million years ago. And not only were these, uh, these, these sediments laid down on the ocean floor, but they were also laid down on top of and buried a lot of the organisms that lived in the ocean in that time. And because the sedimentation was fairly rapid, uh, a lot of these marine organisms were essentially smothered in place giving us a snapshot of the marine system, marine ecosystem at that time. In many ways, uh, these assemblages are preserved as they were living 350 million years ago, which allows us to assess these surfaces and the organisms that live on them, much like we would assess the bottom of a living marine ecosystem. Uh, we, can, we can apply some of the same marine biology and ecology techniques to these surfaces um, that are very old. In addition to things like, and I'll step back one slide, but in addition to things like corals and brachiopods and, and snails, uh, we also find other marine organisms like uh, crinoids. And crinoids, of course, are the focus of this talk. And uh, you can see numerous examples of these specimens in these photographs. Uh, the table that is set up in the room also has a lot of crinoids from the area uh, on it for you to look at. And I'll, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the specimens that you have on the table. Well, again, if we go back to this Mississippian period, when much of North America was covered by a warm, shallow sea, um, we see a lot of organisms that are familiar to us, uh, like you know sharks and snails and so forth. But there are also organisms that were very common, that are not quite so common today in the oceans. And of particular note are the crinoids. During the Mississippian, in fact, crinoids were so abundant that uh, this time is often referred to as the age of crinoids. In fact, if you were to have walked along the beach 350 million years ago, uh, it is very likely that you would have seen a lot of, if you're beachcombing, you would have seen a lot of bits and pieces of crinoids uh, washed up, washed up along the shorelines. Now, uh, sometimes when I talk about crinoids or I talk about the Mississippi and the, the age of crinoids, uh, this is kind of the response that I get: um, the age of what? You know, what, what's a crinoid? What is a crinoid, and, and why do I study them? Why would anyone study such a thing? How does someone study crinoids? How do you get into such a thing? And I, I plan to address both of those questions this evening. Uh, first, I will talk a little bit about what are crinoids, and then a little bit later in the presentation, I'll talk to you about uh, my introduction to them. First of all, crinoids are echinoderms, or spiny-skinned animals. They are relatives to things like starfish and sea urchins. In today's oceans, there are five major groups of living echinoderms. There are asteroids. Um, uh, sorry, asteroids are here. Asteroids are starfish, people often call them starfish. Ophiroids, which are brittle stars and serpent stars. Uh, echinoids, which are you know, sea urchins and sand dollars and so forth. And then you have the holothurians, or sea cucumbers. And the fifth group um, is represented by the crinoids. And crinoids, um, which deserve the largest photograph and the biggest font size. <laughs> Really, you know, you don't you don't see them that often. At least stocked crinoids in, in modern marine environments. You can see the uh, the stockless forms uh, fairly commonly, but crinoids have been around for a very long time. This is a spindle diagram which reflects changing patterns of diversity in crinoids through time. They appeared in the Ordovician about 500 million years ago, and in fact, the 
oldest known crinoids are also somewhat regional. Uh, many of the oldest known crinoids are from down along the Idaho-Utah border in, in Franklin Basin. Uh, but they, they rapidly diversified. You can see this major expansion in the Mississippi and of their diversity during this age of crinoids. And throughout the Paleozoic or age of fish, uh, they were quite abundant and, and dominant, at least in terms of diversity and so forth, and also abundance. Um, but near the end of the Paleozoic, they suffered this really horrible bottleneck during the end Permian mass extinction, which was the greatest mass extinction in the history of the Earth. Maybe around 95% of the species that existed in the oceans at that time went extinct. Uh, they barely squeaked through that extinction event, but they did survive that extinction event and survived into the age of dinosaurs when they rediversified, and they continue to live today. Crinoids are remarkable survivors, in fact. Uh, they're organisms that appeared well before the age of dinosaurs, and unlike the dinosaurs, well, with the exception of birds, uh, they have persisted. They continue to persist today. Uh, most crinoids, in some ways you can think of a crinoid as an upside-down starfish on a stick. Um, if, you, if you take a starfish and you flip it upside down, in the center of that starfish is what? The mouth. And that starfish often has five feeding arms, and in the grooves of those arms are little tube feet that are used for locomotion and for capturing food and so forth. Crinoids also have a mouth, and they have two feet for both capturing food, and also uh, they can use them for locomotion. Uh, this is essentially the, star the starfish portion of the animal, and here's the stick. So we lift up a starfish, sometimes we branch the arms more than just five times, we flip that starfish upside down, and we put it on a stick, and, uh, and we essentially have a crinoid. And I'll talk more that, about that in a moment. Most of the crinoids that we see in the fossil record, most of the crinoids that existed in the Jackson Hole area 350 million years ago had a stalk, like crinoids do, like some crinoids do today. But most crinoids today, these are, these are called uh, sea lilies, by the way, but most crinoids, which are commonly referred to as feather stars, detach from their stalks when they're very young, and they can live a more mobile life. Mm. This group you can find fairly frequently uh, in and around reef environments. Mm. But just to demonstrate further that crinoids are animals, if you go back and look at this picture, I mean, you see that they have some similarities, visual similarities to plants. But to demonstrate that, that crinoids are animals and they're echinoderms, I want to do two things. First, I want to show you this. If you look at this specimen, you'll note that it has five-part symmetry, like a lot of starfish and sea urchins do. You can see that largely you can divide this animal up into five. And generally, the arms are arranged. These are the bases of the arms. The arms are arranged in groups of five. And along those arms, again, there are little grooves. And those grooves transport food. You can see the arms here. Those, those arms capture food. And that food is transported down grooves in the arm and into a central mouth on the body of the animal. And they have an intestine, they have a nervous system, there are boy and girl crinoids, um, they have all the you know, features of animals. Uh, in addition, they have an anus, and, and here's an example of a, of a specimen releasing a fecal pellet. Uh, this is this little dark spot on here, this dark organism is actually another echinoderm living on top of this crinoid. This is uh, one of its cousins. It's a uh, brittle star or an ophiroid. But crinoids are animals. And again, you can see crinoids in the oceans today at, at scuba depths and even snorkeling depths. Um, this is, again, a, a stalkless crinoid. This is a feather star uh, from the reefs around Palau. And uh, because they do not have a stalk, they're free to use their arms to crawl into crevices uh, in the reef. Uh, maybe they will hide during the day and come out at night when fish are less active and feed in the safety of darkness. Uh, also, some of these stalkless crinoids, I think they, you know, maybe they just sort of feel the need to uh, act like their, their crinoid ancestors with stalks that they'll crawl up things like corals, get up high in the currents, and, uh, and feed as if they had a stalk. 
even though they are, they are truly stalkless organisms. So to see the stalkless crinoids, you can just go scuba diving or snorkeling. But as I mentioned, the stalk forms, those forms uh, like the crinoids that existed here in the past, can only be observed uh, really by submersible. And I had the opportunity not too long ago to go to Roatan um, and uh, take a little trip in this sub and, and see some, some deep sea crinoids. And uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. It was, it was fun because as we, as we head, headed down the reef and submerged in that sub, it was really interesting to see all the light go away. We were essentially heading down to the, to the base of the photic zone and below, I think our deepest dive was around 2,200 feet. Uh, until we were essentially in, in utter darkness. The only light that was available was the light that we took with us on the sub. Um, but once we really turned all the lights on, uh, we had an amazing sight uh, available before us. Uh, and there were lots and lots of crinoids, including the stalkless sea lilies, but also the stalked feather stars. And so again, in these deep marine environments, these stalked crinoids like those that existed in Jackson Hole at one time, uh, are still alive in today's oceans. Here are some examples of the fossil crinoids that are preserved in the rocks in the greater Teton area. A couple of beautiful specimens. Again, you can see the stalk, or at least portions of the stalks on these specimens. The main body of the animal, which is often referred to as the calyx, and then the arms that these specimens use or filter feeding currents. Take another step back. This, this specimen is particularly striking, um, but it is also interesting in that it is an example, it is a better preserved example, of the first crinoid described from the Intermountain West. This is actually that specimen. So this is, this is a similar, uh, it's, it's actually the same species. Uh, not as well preserved, of course. But this specimen was collected uh, by Hayden's 1871 survey, um, one of the first you know, organized expeditions to come into this area and study Yellowstone. And that ultimately led to one of the reasons Yellowstone was established as a, as a national park and so forth. Uh, there's also another specimen described by Meek called Platycrinus Haydeni, named, of course, after Hayden. But uh, I always enjoy. Uh, the historical aspects of, of crinoids and crinoids in the West as well. And, and surprisingly, not a lot was done on crinoids of the greater Teton area um, since this paper was published. Uh, and from, from the time this paper was published until about the 1940s. And in the 1940s, a paleontologist, a crinoid paleontologist from the University of Wisconsin named Lowell Loudon uh, heard of the wonderful crinoid faunas that were available in the West. In particular, he learned of a locality near Bozeman in the Bridger Range called Ferry Lake. And uh, he, uh, being a dedicated crinoid paleontologist, decided to drag all the field camp students from Wisconsin uh, out to Ferry Lake uh, to do you know, geological uh, work. Um, but in, you know, I'm sure he, was mostly just, he mostly had them out there looking for crinoids, right? Uh, but, but anyway, they found many, many specimens, hundreds and hundreds of specimens in the Ferry Lake area. And uh, this is a paper that he published in the 1950s on those crinoids. And so we have the few specimens that were published in the, on it in the 1870s. We have Loudon's work in 1950, uh, 1952, in that, that time of, uh, of the century. And uh, not a whole lot had been done uh, on the lodge pole uh, until I decided to take a bunch of students out there starting a few years ago. And we, we ventured up into the lodge pole to, uh, to, to, to find what we could find. And there's, there's more to this story as well. So why was I interested in taking students into the lodge pole formation? So here we are, right, in this ancient ocean 350 million years ago that covered much of North America, including the area where I grew up, southeast Iowa. <laughs> the same vast ocean that, that covered North America extended all the way into, into my, my hometown, Burlington, Iowa. And Burlington, Iowa is known for, as Mike mentioned, uh, its crinoids. In particular, the Burlington limestone, which is probably the most diverse 
assemblage. It represents the most diverse assemblage of fossil crinoids in all of geologic history. There are somewhere around 300 valid species of crinoids described from this one geologic formation. And when I was in high school, I became very interested in crinoids, in part because of a full year geology uh, elective that I, that I had. And I decided that I wanted to go out and try to find some crinoids, which I did. Here are some examples of crinoids from the Burlington Limestone. And sitting just below the Burlington Limestone, by the way, if you saw Mike's email that went out with that beautiful slab of crinoids from Crawfordsville, Indiana, the crinoids from Crawfordsville, Indiana are from rocks that are the same age as the Keokuk Formation, which overlies the Burlington Limestone. And so Mike's crinoid slab was basically age equivalent with this. The Burlington Limestone is where I cut my teeth on crinoids. And while I was in high school, I also became very interested in a formation that sits just below it called the Wassonville Formation. One of the reasons the Wassonville Formation was interesting to me is that because it is time equivalent with another famous crinoid locality in Iowa called La Grande, which arguably preserves the best crinoids in the world. I mean, the, the, the preservation is absolutely exquisite. When the crinoids, many of the crinoids were first described in the 1870s and so forth, um, color was included in the species descriptions because they seem to show consistent uh, and distinctive, distinctive patterns of, of color. Um, but, but these occur in central Iowa in relatively shallow water environments. Um, but the Wassonville Formation, which again is a time equivalent and is present in eastern Iowa, uh, hadn't really been explored much. Now there should be crinoids there. It's a, it's a good marine environment. And uh, I was excited to look for them. And so while I was in high school, uh, I explored further the Wassonville Formation, explored them in several quarries, and ultimately was able to recover uh, a couple of, you know, several hundred specimens of crinoids from the Wassonville Formation. And uh, many of them are very well preserved, as, as you can see. And, and one of the things that was exciting to me when I graduated from high school and came out to the West, sort of starving for crinoids, um, is, that, is, that I, is that I knew of this lodgepole formation that existed out here. And some of the very same crinoids, like Cusacrinus and Nactocrinus and, and, and Crabanocrinus, that are present in the rocks in southeast Iowa, the, the very same species, in fact, are present in the, the Teton area. And so that was very exciting to me. To, 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 you know, I, I kind of missed home, and it was a way to sort of connect with home, uh, to, to go out and find these, these species of crinoids that I, that I very much loved. And, and so again, as I traveled west, I had an opportunity to get into some rocks, although I will admit that it was much harder than I expected coming out with, out with my, my Iowa legs, right? And, uh, and getting out to the west and, and realizing how much effort you had to put into to getting to some of these places. In the Midwest, we pretty much just drive down into the bottom of a quarry or drive to the edge of a creek and walk around and look for things. Uh, it's a little more involved out here, um, but there are specimens. Uh, there are beautiful crinoids uh, to be discovered in the western United States, in particular the Lodgepole Formation. And let me pause for a moment and, and actually explain something with respect to the geological terminology. Uh, many of you are probably more familiar with the term Madison limestone, uh, if you're familiar with the geology of the area, or the Madison Formation. Uh, the Madison is actually a group that includes two formations, the overlying Mission Canyon and the underlying Lodgepole. And so, and so the Mission, uh, sorry, the, the Madison Limestone, I don't know, it's kind of an old term, it doesn't really exist in some ways. Um, the Madison is divided into the underlying lodge pole and the overlying Mission Canyon. And it is the lodge pole that is essentially the best for finding crime words. I mean, it, it preserves the best specimens. And, and some of the specimens, well, all of the specimens, in fact, you see on, on this slide are crinoids from the Lodgepole Formation. Now, 
I could say much about the taxonomy of the crinoids and the logical formation. Um, but to be quite honest with you, uh, taxonomy doesn't make a very good presentation. And uh, it's, it's really not that interesting unless you're really, really into the, the group at hand. Uh, and to be honest, my favorite aspect of crinoid paleontology is paleoecology. I'm very much more interested in interactions between organisms in their environment and interactions between organisms and other organisms in that environment. But taxonomy is very important. Uh, taxonomy is, I, I suppose taxonomy is important in the way spelling, grammar, and punctuation is to a novelist, right? You gotta, you gotta know it. You have to know your taxonomy. Uh, to be able to do paleoecology, to tell the bigger picture, to understand the rest of the story. Um, so, so taxonomy is important to me, but I'm not going to talk very much about it. If you have any questions about taxonomy, we can address it. But I'm, I'm planning to move on to, I think, the more interesting paleoecology. But before I do that, um, not, I want to mention that not only are there beautiful crinoids preserved in the logical formation, but there are also other echinoderms, and echinoderms with which you might be more familiar. For example, there are, what's this? Sea, sea urchins, sea urchin, right? There are sea urchins in the logical formation. At least five different kinds. And there are also, uh, this is actually a brittle star. It's an ophiroid, um, but there are also asteroids or starfish. Uh, we have some beautiful five-armed starfish preserved in the logical formation. And this next specimen is a real tree, although it's a little bit difficult to see. This is how the specimen was discovered in the field. Uh, fortunately, the specimen is preserved mouth up. This specimen is currently being prepared by someone who I consider to be one of the best fossil preparators in the world in Indiana. It's such a unique specimen that I, I wanted to have it done uh, as well as it possibly could be. I'm not sure if you, you can see this yet, but this is actually a large, there's a kind of a gardening glove or work glove for scale. Um, this is a large, probably 17 to 18 armed starfish. And uh, the mouth is exposed here. Well, it's not exposed, it's under the, uh, the rock. Um, but it will be exposed here. But these are the arms. You can see the arms, you can even see them down here, just barely exposed, peeking, peeking through the rock. But this is a very large, beautiful, multi-armed starfish. So there are other echinoderms that exist in the lodgepole formation. Some groups also that uh, are extinct. So this is uh, a brachiopod. It's actually zoomed in right here. I actually, I messed up. There's a, there's a little uh, Burt's Bees uh, chapstick container right back here. <laughs> it's about this tall compared to these specimens, right? So it's, there's a couple inches right there. Uh, but these are, these are extinct echinoderms called edrioasteroids. And uh, you can see the five-part symmetry in some of these fairly well. In some ways, they're like an upside-down like, like upside starfish that's stuck in a little disk of plates. They didn't move like a barnacle doesn't move. And they attach to hard surfaces like these are attaching to the back of this brachiopod. And they, they sat there fixed. Uh, and again, they would have had the little tube feet like any kind of urn associated with these five feeding uh, grooves. And, uh, and they would have sat on the back of that brachiopod and filtered the ocean's four currents. Hmm. There are also other uh, echinoderms that you can find in the logical formation, things called blastoids that are also extinct. Unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of one here. But again, I, I want to move on. I could show you nice pictures of fossils from the logical formation all day, but I want to provide you with a little bit of content. And so I want to focus on a field locality in Montana that I've been working on with some of my students just northwest of Yellowstone Park. It's just outside the park in, a, in an area called the Taylor Hill Guard Unit of the Lee Metcalf Wilderness in the, in the Madison Range in Montana. And this is an absolutely, you can't see it from the road. Uh, we actually found this locality using Google Earth. Once you get on, once you find it on Google Earth, like you just can't miss it. I mean, you can probably see this exposure of rock uh, from space. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's just this gorgeous exposure of rock in the middle of all of this forest. 
And um, for, for the geologists in the room especially, I'll point this out. So these are Precambrian gneisses. This is the Great Unconformity. And it's beautifully exposed along there. It's a really neat place to walk. This is, uh, the, this is a Precambrian Cambrian contact, in fact. These are all Cambrian age strata. And then this is a, a fairly significant unconformity with Devonian rocks above them. And this is then the Mississippian. This is the Lodgepole Formation. Uh, the Mission Canyon, which is the upper part of the Madison Limestone, sits just above that off the picture. And then above that, there are some Pennsylvanian sandstones. And so you have this completely exposed section that goes all the way from the Precambrian uh, into the Pennsylvanian with no vegetation to obscure it in any way whatsoever. It's just a really gorgeous uh, geological laboratory, and I've taken advantage of it to help teach students. Um, and of course, if you are interested in paleoecology, not only is it important to understand the fossils, but it's very important also to understand the, the rocks that those fossils are in. And so one of the first things we, we needed to do was measure a stratigraphic section. And we've measured many stratigraphic <coughs> sections now and described those sections in the lodgepole formation. Um, we try to, of course, describe rock type and interpret depositional environments and understand patterns of sea level change as we go from the bottom of the formation through the top of the formation to put all of these very important fossil beds in context. And here we are at the Devonian Mississippian boundary. By the way, at the end of the Devonian, there was a massive extinction event as well that eliminated a lot of reefs and so forth. Um, but we're just above that extinction boundary at the base of the Lodgepole Formation, and uh, we measured up from there. And just to give you some examples of, of the stratigraphy uh, and, the, and the types of rocks that are present, uh, here you can see uh, some of our units broken out in outcrop. Uh, so units 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Each one of these units, of course, just represents a significant change in, in uh, rock type and other characteristics of the rocks. And uh, we see, for example, a lot, a lot of grain stones, really grainy limestones. And above a lot of those grainy limestones, we often find uh, flooding surfaces. And so this represents a surface where, where uh, sea level rose relatively quickly. This would represent relatively shallow water. Uh, here would be a flooding surface, and the deposits above that surface would represent relatively deep water. And those deeper water environments are typically represented by rocks like mudstones that tend to have fewer fossils in them. And also you can see our, our interpretation there. We interpret this as essentially representing an outer part of that ramp from that ancient depositional system. And, and these are uh, sort of deeper slope environments, uh, dropping down into uh, deeper water settings. If we look at some of the shallow, wa shallow water rocks, we see rocks that look very much like these, with lots and lots of relatively coarse crinoids in them, and broken up, disarticulated. And then if we, we look at, into the uh, deeper water environments, we tend to find muddy rocks with, uh, with crinoids still. Uh, but they tend to be a little bit smaller. So one of the nice things also about uh, studies like these is that they don't require the collection of any specimens. Uh, we really don't have to take anything home. We can collect our data in the field. And uh, this is one of my students, uh, former students, Preston. He's teaching high school now in, uh, in, over in the Boise area. He's teaching, I think it's high school, maybe it's junior high. Uh, but he's teaching in the, in the, in the, in the Boise area. But what Preston did, we went through this section. We went from the bottom of the section after we'd measured it to the top of the section. And we looked for bedding surfaces that were very fossil rich. And we assessed the number of different species on those bedding surfaces, the abundance of each one of those species on the bedding surfaces. And then we moved up. And we continued to do this to try to answer a few questions about the logical formation. We are, for example, interested in understanding at the very large scale how species uh, diversity and also abundance were distributed through the logical formation. Uh, we were also wondering how the distributions of fossils, of different kinds of fossils and communities, associations of fossils, were associated with water depth, with different kinds of depositional environments. Um, 
basically we were trying to understand the big picture, right? First order patterns of the ancient ecology of this ocean system. And so we, we analyzed those data. Basically, we, you know, Preston uh, looked at 60 different slabs throughout the section uh, and counted presence and absence of about 40 different and also abundances of 40 different species on those slabs. And then we analyzed those data. And uh, as, as we analyzed those data, we found some pretty discrete patterns. Um, what these data basically suggest is that we have different groups of organisms, different collections of organisms that were more or less abundant in different environments within the logical formation as you go again from sh fairly shallow water into fairly deep in the water. So, so big picture is that this analysis allowed us to capture some big picture ecological changes in the community of community organization of crinoids in this ancient, and, and other organisms in this ancient marine system. Another student uh, who worked in the lodgepole formation, uh, Scott Kelly, who's now teaching at UVU and Westminster College down in, down in Utah. Um, Scott, notice, notice Scott's not carrying a hammer. You probably really can't tell what Scott's carrying in his hand. Um, but Scott is collecting data on the outcrop using essentially nothing but calipers and a pencil. And I'll explain why he's doing that in a moment. He's basically trying to address this question. So another question that we had about fossils and, and essentially life in the logical formation is, is there a relationship between body size, crinoid body size, and sea level? So let me explain a little bit more about that. Body size is a very fundamental variable uh, for, for organisms. And in marine ecosystems, uh, things like environmental energy and predation, uh, the nutrient availability, all of those things can have a significant input or an in effect on, on body size. And a lot of those variables, like again, energy and light and nutrient availability and predation intensity, a lot of those things are correlated with water depth. And because of that, you might expect there be, to be patterns in changes in body size with water depth. And so uh, I should also mention that some recent work on marine gastropods and other organisms uh, has demonstrated that some species, some groups of gastropods, tend to get larger <laughs> as you move into deeper water environments. And others tend to get smaller as you move into deeper water environments. So again, there are some trends in body size, but depending on the group that you're looking at, well, it might go one way or the other. And so we were interested, interested in seeing if we, could, if we could find changes in body size that correlated with changes in water depth. And so really, you know, you have a couple of working hypotheses, right? These are pretty self-evident. Um, hypothesis one is that body size would increase with depth, or body size might decrease with depth or there might be no correlation between body size and depth. And so this is something we set out to explore using crinoids. And so essentially what Scott is measuring here is he's measuring the little disks that make up the stalks of the crinoids. Wow. Complete crinoids aren't found all throughout the section, making it difficult to look at complete crinoids in this way. But the columnals, the little broken up bits and pieces of their stalks, are everywhere. And so what Scott was using as a proxy for body size is crinoid columnal diameter. And uh, he collected about 30 crinoid columnals, crinoid columnal diameter with his calipers, in every unit of just basically any crinoids. But he also collected, he tried to collect 30 columnal diameters from one very particular, one very diagnostic uh, elliptical crinoid type. Let me show that to you. And so some crinoids, again, in the logs pole have these elliptical crinoid columnals. The shapes, the shapes of each individual columnal are elliptical. And then others, of course, have round columnals. Oops. Uh, these, are, these are round. 
And so we also took an additional 30 measurements from each unit of just these elliptical forms. And we did that to try to minimize any bias related to taxonomy. We figured if we just used crinoid columnals from the same group of crinoids, there would be less, less bias uh, in, in the system. And so we looked at both. And I'll mention right now that both showed the same general pattern. First, I want to show you this. So here are units. Here's our essentially measured stratigraphic column. And these are changes in mean crinoid columnal diameter as you go through the section. They're definitely patterns. Crinoid columnal diameter is not constant as you move through the lodgepole formation. And so the next thing we were interested in doing, of course, is finding out if these changes in crinoid columnal diameter corresponded with changes in water depth. And we did that by, by essentially looking at changes in grain size in rocks. So these are essentially uh, coarser, I should say, these are coarser rocks as you move to this side of the curve, and these are finer grain rocks as you move to, to this side of the curve. And all we were doing is looking at changes in directionality. So if we look at crinoid columnal diameter from one unit to the next, is it getting smaller or is it getting bigger? And likewise, what's happening with the rocks? What story is the, rock, are the, are the rocks telling us? Are the rocks showing uh, an, an increase in water depth or a decrease in water depth? And is there any relationship there in the directionality of change between crinoid columnal diameter and water depth based on rock type? And what we determined is that there was a very strong correlation in the directionality. Um, a significant correlation in the directionality, with this being the outcome. Smaller crinoids are associated with deeper water environments. So there's a very strong correlation between crinoid body size and water depth. Smaller the crinoids, the deeper the water. The shallower the crinoids, the, or the shallower the water, the, the larger the crinoids. This is essentially the pattern that we found in both data sets, uh, in the round columnals and the elliptical ones. They both essentially told us the, the same story. Uh, and, and interestingly, again, this is, this is rock type, and this is our interpretation of depositional environments. What I want to do now is just demonstrate this a little bit further. I want to walk you through um, some parts of our stratigraphic column. So here, for example, you can see that crinoid columnal diameter is getting very large. This is also associated with the general change in grain size, and in grain types, just say rock type. Here we see very, uh, very coarse, grain-rich grainstones, limestones with a lot of fossils in them. And if we look at this part of the section, this near the bottom of the lodgepole formation is actually a large carbonate buildup. It's almost like a deep water reef that's bound together by bryozoans and crinoids. And so this is a mound of sediment that is building up off the bottom of the seafloor around it into relatively shallow water environments. And it is with this buildup into shallow water that we tend to see our largest crinoid columns. And I'll show you this too. You've seen this image before. And so this is a grain stone that represents relatively shallow water further up the slope. Um, and this is relatively deep water. And note that the rocks, or the crinoid columnals, are trending towards smaller sizes as you move from this deeper water environment, excuse me, as you move from the shallower water environment into this deeper water environment. And this is the same story as we move up this, up this stratigraphic section. So here's, here's a package of rocks. At the bottom of this package of rocks, we see relatively um, fine-grained mudstones on the distal slope environment. And as we move a little bit further in that package of rocks, uh, we see um, we're moving sort of into shallower water environments. We see that the crinoid grain sizes are increasing. 
Again, this is consistent with the, the general pattern that we observed before. Here's another example. As we move up the section, we have some really coarse grain stones um, that are relatively shallow water, and then we have another flooding surface, and then we have deeper marine sediments on top of that. Uh, this, again, shows a pattern of crinoid columnal size, diameter, decreasing. Uh, consistent with this pattern, we get near the top, and we see a lot of these little stacked sequences of rock with relatively uh, thin bedded, fossil poor mudstones below, grading up into coarser wax, uh, wacky stones, pack stones, and grain stones above. And, uh, and we see again small crinoid columnals below in the deeper water environments, and larger crinoid columnals above in the shallower water environments. We see this pattern just sort of going back and forth uh, until the lodge pole ends and uh, the depositional system changes in the overlying Mission Canyon formation, we see a lot more restricted uh, depositional environments uh, and, and many fewer crying words. So another question that we addressed, and uh, this is the last question that I'll talk about, crinoid related question, and just general paleoecological question that uh, we tried to address in the lodgepole formation. So again, in the lodgepole, uh, there were these, I want to remind you, Pat Patrick, another student, former student who's working on a graduate degree in Florida in marine biology right now. Uh, this is a, pa a question that Patrick helped me tackle. So if you remember that in this environment, there were these, these mud flows, right? They were transported down slope and buried these specimens alive and in place. And so in many ways, after those organisms were buried, that seafloor had to start over again. It had to become recolonized, and it had to begin again. You just wiped out the organisms that were living on the bottom of the seafloor. And so a question that we had is, is how often did this happen to such an extent that it covered things so extensively that again, it, it essentially reset the seafloor community. So here's an example of one of these abrusion beds. Abrusion, let me explain this, terminal abrusion event. I kind of already have explained it. Abrusion is essentially uh, just a fancy word for complete smothering of the bottom, bottom uh, living community. Terminal wipes everything out. So again, how often did this occur? How often do we take this gorgeous marine ecosystem, eliminate it, and have to start all over again? Well, to answer this question, interestingly enough, we looked at corals. In many layers within the lodgepole formation, there are these beautiful colonial corals preserved. And one of the neat things about corals, we looked at this in a couple of different ways. One, we looked at growth rates of living corals to estimate how long it might have taken for these corals to grow to the sizes that they grew. But another thing that we were able to do was to look at um, cross sections and actually have this coral here. And if you look at corals that are well enough preserved, you can actually see banding in them. Hopefully everyone can see the banding in these corals. Here it is. Just like trees, exactly. So corals have growth rings. And each one of these pairs of growth rings represents one year of growth. And to further test that these represented one year of growth, that each one of these pairs of bands represent one year of growth, we actually uh, took from several coral colonies um, powdered samples. So we essentially powdered a variety of these samples. Every one of these samples we powdered. And we sent that powdered limestone back to the University of Michigan to be analyzed in their isotope lab. And, and we were able to tell by looking at oxygen-18 and oxygen-16 isotopes um, that there were seasonal fluctuations between these, these light and dark bands. And so, sort of further affirming that these pairs represent seasons of growth. And here's another interesting thing about a story this coral tells us. And that is, if you look at the margins, the growing margins of the corals, you can see die-off events where the coral colony is essentially smothered by sediment during perhaps a season of greater storminess when more sedimentation is occurring in the ocean. The sediments generally would have made the ocean very turbid, 
you'd have had more sediment falling out. Perhaps you'd have also had lower growth rates of the corals as, as sunlight was, was diminished or, or you know, for other factors, fouling of the coralites and so forth. But essentially what you see is die off of the coral colony and then in the second half of the season, or the second part of the year, they, they started to recover. They started to grow back. So die off, grow back, die off, grow back, die off, grow back. And so we also see, see this seasonal impact uh, on the coral colonies themselves. But by looking at the sizes of the corals that exist in the logical formation associated with these bedding surfaces, um, we essentially have been able to tell that these terminal burial events occur uh, no less than once every decade. So every decade or so, in this environment 350 million years ago, there was a burial event that was so extreme that it essentially smothered the entire bottom community. Um, there, no coral ever grew older than about 10 years in this, in this lodgepole formation. Mm -hmm. And uh, another interesting thing that I'll note along these same lines is that when we find the corals in the lodgepole formation, Many times they're turned over. They've been transported a little bit in these flows. Sometimes we find them in, in place, but a lot of times they show evidence of transport. Sometimes we even find them flipped completely upside down. And uh, a coral with its coralites buried in the mud uh, doesn't often do so well, especially when it's completely buried in the mud and uh, buried alive and buried for good. So, in general, I, I hope that you can see that the surrounding area, the, the rocks, the, the Madison, uh, no, what do you call it, the, uh, the, Ma the Madison, yeah, the Madison limestone. The Madison limestone or the Madison group, especially the lodgepole formation, uh, does preserve some beautiful, and not only beautiful, but very data-rich fossils. And in the lodgepole formation, the data suggest, the fossils suggest, that there are communities of organisms that are distributed by depth. The communities, just like in modern day environments, we see evidence that these marine communities are changing as we go into deeper and deeper waters. And not only are the communities themselves are changing, but an, a decrease in water depth, or I say an increase in water depth, also is associated with a decrease in the body size of the organisms that were living in the logical formation. And another thing that I'll mention that I didn't mention in the main part of the presentation is that we have since measured two other stratigraphic sections in the logical formation, one near Lionhead, if you're familiar with that area, just outside of West Yellowstone, and also uh, on Mount Jefferson in the Centennial Range, not far from Sawtell Peak and Island Park. And remarkably, we've been able to correlate or match up those three stratigraphic columns by doing no nothing more than correlating the patterns of crinoid columnal diameter. We can ignore the rocks, we can ignore the fossils, at least fossil type, and just focus on changing patterns of crinoid columnal diameters to match up rocks from one place to another. And uh, I think that's, that's a pretty interesting thing that, that we've you've discovered there. And also, I think that the information from corals tells us an interesting story in that these communities were short-lived. They didn't live very long in this ancient marine environment before they were wiped out by, by submarine uh, sediment flows. And finally, one of the greatest things that I've, I've taken away from this work in the logical formation is not really the fossils, it's, it's, it's not necessarily um, the information that we've gathered, although that's all been very exciting and, and rewarding. Uh, for me, in many ways, what's been most rewarding is seeing the impact some of this work has had uh, in the lives of, of budding geologists. Uh, again, all of these students are still in geology. Scott's, Scott's teaching at the university level. Uh, Preston's teaching at the K through 12 level. And uh, Martel and Patrick are, are in graduate school, you know, near, nearing the completion of their degrees in related fields. And uh, that has been very rewarding. Wonderful outdoor classroom and laboratory 
uh, not only for myself, but you know, it gives me an opportunity to share as well. And uh, I want to remind all of you geologists in the room of that beautiful great unconformity back there. It's just a gorgeous exposure. I just, I just can't get over the outcrops that, that are available in this area. Um, they sure beat the little holes we get in Iowa and, and the mossed over creeks. Uh, you know, in, in many ways, they're just, they're just remarkable and they're breathtaking. And the vistas they provide are, are outstanding. Uh, and and uh, you know, you talk about a wonderful geological uh, laboratory. Uh, it's hard to beat uh, the Tetons. It's hard to beat uh, you know the big snowy mountains, the tobacco roots, um, the Madison. I already mentioned the Madison Range, uh, the Centennial Range. All of these mountain tops uh, are have have lodgepole formation exposed in them, and uh, help us put together this this wonderful story of the area 350 million years ago. Uh, I thank you again for your attention. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. There is, in fact, you know, my, my specialty and what I would very much love to talk to about, talk to uh, with you sometime about is, is predation and parasitism on prime weeds. That is a whole other ball of wax. I can get in. You know, we can do a couple more hours on that if you want to. Uh, there, so, so yeah, I was just going to mention that I actually brought a crinoid that has regenerated arms. You might repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was, is there any evidence for predation or parasitism on any of these crinoids? The answer is yes. Uh, I didn't quite get to that in the talk, but there are examples of crinoids that have had their arms probably bitten. Uh, you can see evidence of them growing back. Uh, we also see evidence of snails infesting crinoids. So they're, they're snails that usually attach to the anal vent of crinoids and feed off of their feces and even steal food from the crinoids. Uh, we have evidence of that as well in the lodgepole formation. Yeah, you want that? Yes? I was curious how you um, used the grain side of the proxy for water depth. How did you yeah. rationalize that? Well, gen general, carbonates are a little bit tricky. Generally, in carbonate environments, out in the middle of the platform, you tend to have your grainiest sediments uh, where, where water sort of winnows away the muds. And when the, in the higher energy, when the higher energy winnows away the muds, it usually transports those muds into quieter water lagoons near the shore or deeper water offshore. And generally, grainstones, this isn't always the case. I, I remember when I was in, in Roatan in that sub, uh, one of the things that surprised me is at the bottom of those slopes, we often found these really, really coarse-grained uh, pack stones. Uh, you know, with, if you're familiar with Palomita, it's a coral and algae that lives in relatively shallow waters, um, but it was deposited really in, in you know, these deep environments. If I were to find a sediment like that in the rock record, I would assume that it's relatively shallow, but in fact, it was just a, a shallow water sediment that was transported into really deep I'm not really answering your question very directly, but the answer is, is, is generally higher energy, shallower water carbonates uh, tend, to, tend to be really grain rich and not have much mud in them. And you tend to see increasing amounts of mud in those sediments as you go into the deeper water environments of the logical formation. Mm -hmm. And so that's generally why, why, why we're able to use rock type <coughs> And, and associate rock type with water depth also. And I should also take a step back and talk about that correlation because that correlation was really just with changes in, in rock type that we inferred, and I think many people do, that were associated also with changes in water depth. But then those, those changes also associated with our interpretations of water depth based on our descriptions of the, of the sections that we measured. So, yeah. Yeah, you bet. So the question was, is there a correlation between uh, crinoid body size, perhaps, and, and the availability of light and, and oxygen? Certainly, as you move into deeper water environments, 
Uh, you, you can have, you will have less light, and, and you can have less oxygen. And, uh, and certainly the, the lower concentrations of oxygen could be an explanation for why body size is smaller in those deeper water environments. Light doesn't matter so much to them. Uh, crinoids don't need light really for anything, uh, which is why they can live at, at very, very deep depths. I saw not too long ago a picture of a crinoid in the Mariana Trench. Uh, so, so they, they, you know, they, they can, they don't, the light's not so much an, an issue to them. But things like oxygen and nutrient availability, those sorts of things would, would definitely have an impact. Oxygen's an important one. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm visiting from New York, so I appreciate that I actually saw that there was a talk this evening. Oh, know. yeah, no problem. And um, I teach your science in New York. But I have a question, so I'm not really big with crinoids. The stem of the crinoid, yeah. the size of that, is that based on like turbidity of the water? Do you need a stronger, bigger one in shallow water and you can get away with the weakness? Yeah, generally, generally I think so. I, I mean, a, 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 a thicker stocked crinoid is going to be more robust and better able to handle the higher energy conditions of shallow water. So is that the correlation that when you see that and you also connected that with the mud and the use the rock correlation with yeah. water depth, is that the connection as well? That the reason why they're bigger is because they need to have that as their stability. Yeah, that can that can certainly factor in. And there, there are other uh, factors here that, that I did not address. <laughs> Um, but you know some groups of crinoids which have thicker stalks prefer shallow wa shallower water environments, and others which have thinner stalks pr prefer deeper water environments. So there can be a taxonomic bias there too in that pattern, just because some big crinoids like shallow water and more you know thinner crinoids like deeper water. And, but but that's why we, we also looked at just those elliptical columnals because they're all pretty much from the same crinoids. And we saw the same pattern in those elliptical forms, sort of allowing us to eliminate that taxonomic bias and suggest that it really was some environmental factor that was having an influence on body size, like oxygen or nutrient availability. <clears throat> there was something else I was going to say about your, your question. Oh, this, this is what you reminded me of, you know, asking you about crinoid stocks and so forth. On the table, you can see a variety of examples of different kinds of crinoids from the logical <coughs> formation. But I also have a specimen or a, a glass jar with three specimens of crinoids from the Caribbean, living stock crinoids from the Caribbean. Uh, so you can, you can look at those two and their stocks, of course. Yes. Uh, can you know or speculate about whether or not the crinoid stems had muscle and whether they would, on purpose, even if they were tethered, move other than just by the force of the water? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we really don't have to speculate on that too much because we still have crinoids with stalks living today. We, of course, have to speculate about the crinoids in the past, but no crinoids have muscles in their stalks. Outside the stalk? No, 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 no muscles associated with the stalk at all. Uh, but some crinoids, do have muscles in their arms. So they have muscles between the little plates of their arms, but not in the stalk. But echinoderms generally have a really remarkable tissue called mutable collagenous tissue that does show some contractile-like properties, or it does show contractile properties, just like muscle, yeah, but it's, but it's, but it's not true muscle. Um, but that's sort of beside the point in this instance, uh, because another important point to make here is that uh, crinoids, some of which do have muscles in their arms, can move around on the bottom of the ocean floor, even with a stalk, uh, by using those, those arms. And we, we know they could do that at least since the Jurassic period. Not long ago, there was a paper described of a, of a surface from Portugal, from the Jurassic, that had a crinoid crawling over the surface. You can see its crawling trace behind it. Really neat paper. But if you just get onto something like YouTube or Google and type uh, crawling crinoid, uh, you can see video of stalked crinoids using their arms and dragging their stalks behind them, uh, basically crawling on the ocean floor. Again, it's another example of, uh, of 
why primates aren't plants, right? I don't see plants using their petals and, you know, moving along in the grass and find a better place to get sunlight. Uh, but but primates are able to move around. Yes? Yes. I use the, log, the word lodgepole a lot again because uh, it is the name of the geologic formation that preserves most of the fossils that I was discussing. So if you look at some stratigraphic <coughs> columns of the Tetons, you'll see on, on that stratigraphic column a package of rock called the Madison Limestone. The Madison Limestone is really a group called the Madison Group that includes two formations. The underlying lodgepole formation, which is mostly what I was discussing today, and the overlying Mission Canyon. And so it's just a name of a package of rock. It's just a name that geologists have given to a package of rock. What is the time? The lodgepole pine, right. And perhaps it is named for the lodgepole pine. But it, it, other than that, it has nothing to do with the lodgepole pine. Uh, and everything to do with beautiful limestones from the Mississippian uh, that are loaded with crinoids in this area. Uh, since the, the stocks sort of were no longer valuable, I guess, in the shallow water environments, so they lost them and they still have them in the deep water environments, what do you infer then was the purpose of the stock? Okay, know, that's, that's a great area? question. So the purpose of the stock is thought to essentially just be to elevate that feeding apparatus up off the bottom of the ocean floor and up into currents, right? right. Uh, where they can get plankton and so forth. Uh, so the stock is, is functional for that reason. But many of the crinoids that lived in this area 350 million years ago were not like the crinoids that you can watch on YouTube. They were permanently <laughs> attached to the bottom of the ocean floor. They were tethered to the ocean floor. And many of the crinoids that existed in the, at this time showed no evidence for muscles in their arms. So, so muscles come, come later in, in, in groups that, uh, in, in other groups, but um, the, the dominant crinoids at this time lacked muscles in their arms. They were permanently attached to the bottom of the ocean floor. And, and many crinoids, including some that have stalks today, are still permanently attached to the bottom of the ocean floor. And back in the Jurassic, and, and especially in the Cretaceous, we see the diversification of a lot of marine predators, like modern groups of fish, Keliost fishes, and the diversification of a lot of crustaceans, crabs, and, and, and so forth. And crinoids were literally sitting ducks on the bottom of the ocean floor. Here you have this big, meaty structure that is just hovering above the ocean, just waiting you know, for something to come along. It's not like it can get away. A stock primate can't get away from a fish. Uh, and so, during the Mesozoic, during the age of dinosaurs, we no longer see stalked crinoids living abundantly in shallow, well-lit environments. The only place we see them, after the diversification of these predators, is in the deep ocean, where it is dark and those predators have a harder time encountering them. And if you look at a lot of the crinoids that have adapted to living in shallow water, they again, they, they lose the stalk, which allows them to use those muscles in their arms to crawl into a crack in the reef during the day and crawl back out at night to feed. How do they make up for the loss of the height? You know? uh, one, one, reef, one way that they do that is by crawling up onto high things, yeah. like, like high reef rocks, or I showed you that coral earlier in the presentation, where those crinoids were attached to the, to the top of that coral, again, kind of pretending or acting as if they had a stock, right, once again. Um, but, but anywhere they can find flow in those reef environments, you know, you'll often see them sticking out their arms and, and filtering the currents for food. But yeah, we, we lose most of our stalked crinoids in well-lit environments, probably due to predation during the age of dinosaurs. The oceans were becoming increasingly dangerous places to live for marine invertebrates that were stuck in place. Boris? Yes? Uh, two related questions. Uh, deep water, uh, strictly speaking, actually, how deep is the deep water? That's a good and, question. And those 10-year or sooner or more frequent events, uh, speculate on what those were. So, 
My guess is that those 10-year events were, were very large storms. They, they could have been hurricanes or something like that. They were occurring large, super large hurricanes that were occurring on a frequency of every decade or so. Um, but we also see more regular events, like you saw in the notches on that coral. Uh, there, were, there were events that were occurring almost on an annual basis. And I think that those are probably related to increased turbidity in the water, increased sedimentation in the water um, associated with changes in seasonality. Uh, but I, I think there were probably large storms. And actual deep water was how deep? Uh, the, second, the, the first part of that couple part question. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a tough thing to assess. Um, but I, I would guess somewhere around two, 3,000 feet. Somewhere in that ballpark, we're not even sure that these corals were living in well-lit environments. Uh, you know, some corals rely on the sun because they have little algae essentially that live in their tissues that, that need sunlight. But there are other groups of corals that can live in very, very deep waters because they're relying solely on the little stinging cells in their in their tissues for capturing meatier foods. And uh, so, so. Generally, I think in the lodge pole formation, we are we're dealing with a fairly deep water environment uh, near the base of the photic zone, and then and then well below it. Hmm. Why don't we cut it off there? It looks like we've uh, sure. well exhausted the questions. I'll remind you that Forrest will be here at the table answering all your detailed questions you could possibly imagine. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions about these things. And two other things that I hope you learn from this talk is <laughs> geologists really can get a whole lot of information out of a whole lot of very detailed information. All those charts and graphs and things. And yes, it's a lot of hard work, and that's what Jeff Redmond's doing for. Secondly, well, congratulations. Yeah. So before we, uh, and secondly, the most important area a geologist likes to look for is not a pretty area. It's an area like this. And he said it very quickly. When you see an area like this, it has no cover. You can really get in in detail and do the geology in detail. Pretty doesn't hurt, though. Oh, pretty doesn't hurt. Hey, a few minutes. And Mike? Yes, before we uh, finish and move all the chairs, uh, I wanted to thank Forrest for a wonderful presentation. And I hope you'll. This is really this is a gift for you. Thank you.